Here we're gonna look at two nice but very unrelated problems. So the first one is an inequality involving trig functions, and the second one is a little combinatorics type problem involving sets. So let's look at the first one. So if theta is between zero and pi over two, so in other words, it is an acute angle, so that's measured in radians, so that's zero degrees to 90 degrees, not including zero or 90, then one plus secant theta times one plus cosecant theta is bigger than or equal to five. So let's jump into the solution of this. So I'll start by taking one plus secant theta times one plus cosecant theta and multiplying that out. In other words, like foiling out those two binomials. So that's gonna give us one plus secant theta plus cosecant theta plus secant theta times cosecant theta. Great. And now I wanna immediately notice that we know the size of secant and cosecant, or we know a lower bound for the size of secant and cosecant, given that we're on this open interval zero to pi over two. So let's maybe that write that right here. So let's notice that for theta on the open interval zero to pi halves, we have secant theta is bigger than or equal to one and cosecant theta is bigger than or equal to one. Well, and why is that true? Well, that's clearly true because cosine theta will be between zero and one, excluding zero and one, and then furthermore, sine theta will be between zero and one, again, excluding zero or one. And then when you invert these two inequalities, you gain these two inequalities. Okay, so that means our goal object here, which maybe I'll call goal object goal, we have that it is bound below by one plus one plus one plus this object right here. So that's gonna be three plus secant theta times cosecant theta. So notice what would finish this off? Well, it's clear that if we could show that secant theta times cosecant theta was bigger than or equal to two, then that would finish this off. So let's maybe make that claim and then prove that simple claim. So I'm gonna claim it like this. Secant theta times cosecant theta is bigger than or equal to two for theta in the appropriate range, zero to pi halves like that. Okay, so let's maybe look at the simple proof of this claim. So notice that this is equivalent to a corresponding inequality involving sine and cosine. And that corresponding inequality goes like this. We'll have zero is less than or equal to sine theta times cosine theta, which is less than or equal to half. So notice that this lower bound is obvious because we have theta between zero and pi over two. So we just have to prove this upper bound. But notice that this upper bound will hold if and only if one half minus sine theta cosine theta is bigger than or equal to zero. Again, for all theta on that region right there. So we're gonna actually do this using a bit of calculus. So let's maybe go ahead and set f of theta equal to half minus sine theta cosine theta. And then we'll notice that we can take the derivative and get f prime of theta will be equal to sine squared theta minus cosine squared theta. So let's talk our way through that. So the derivative of a half is zero, and then we're using the product rule here. So we'll hold sine as a constant. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. That wipes out this minus and gives us sine squared. And then likewise, if we hold cosine as constant, take the derivative of sine, we get cosine. That'll give us this minus cosine squared. Now we know that maximums and minimums can only occur at critical points. Those are places where this derivative does not exist or is equal to zero. So here, this derivative will always exist. So let's see where it's equal to zero. So f prime of theta equals zero on the interval zero to pi over two when sine of theta equals cosine of theta. So let's talk our way through that really quick. 
Well, so obviously we set f prime equal to zero. That gives us sine squared minus cosine squared equals zero. Moving things around, we get sine squared equals cosine squared. Taking the square root allows us to get rid of those squares in the sine and the cosine. But then, since we're on this interval zero to pi over two, we don't need to muck around, muck around with absolute values or anything. So we get that right there, sine theta is equal to cosine theta. But sine theta equal cosine theta has an obvious solution on this interval, and that is theta equals pi over four. So that's the only place that a maximum or a minimum can occur on this open interval here, zero to pi over two. Now we can finish our argument off by looking at a sign chart, S-I-G-N chart of F prime. So let's do that right here. So here I'll put my F prime here, and then I'll put pi over four right in the middle. That's our critical point. And then above this line, we'll write the sign of F prime, and then below that line, we'll write what the behavior of this function is. So here, maybe I'll put a dotted line here to show that this is kind of our important dividing line. So if I look at something to the left of pi over four, but notice that it needs to be the right to the right of zero, but I'll let you guys maybe pick some value that you want to like pi over six, we can plug that into the derivative and we will see that we get a negative number. So that tells us that this function is decreasing on the interval from zero to pi over four. And then likewise, we can pick something to the right of pi over four, like pi over three, and we'll see that plugged into the derivative gives us a positive number. That tells us that this function is increasing on the interval from pi over four to pi over two. But that tells us that we have a minimum at theta equals pi over four. But that tells us that our function f of theta is going to be bigger than or equal to f of pi over four. That's the definition of a minimum, is that all other values of the function are bigger than or equal to that value. But notice, if we plug pi over four into our original function, which is right here, we get one half minus one over square root of two times one over square root of two, so that gives us zero. So we end up with f of theta is bigger than or equal to zero, looking at this inequality right here. But notice that is exactly what we wanted because f of theta is defined to be this object over here. If that's bigger than or equal to zero, then this inequality holds. But if that inequality holds, then our claimed inequality holds. But if our claimed inequality holds, then we can mash that into this final bit right here. And we have our goal is bigger than or equal to three plus two, which is equal to five. So that finishes off our solution to this first problem. Now we're ready to look at our second problem, which involves some sets. So let's say we have two arbitrary sets, A and B. We wanna find all sets X satisfying these two conditions. So A intersect X equals B intersect X equals A intersect B, and A union B union X equals A union B. So before we get started, I wanna notice that this condition one and condition two give us some subset relationships between X, the union of A and B, and the intersection of A and B. So first off, this first condition will imply that a intersect B is a subset of X. So that follows pretty quickly from the definition of intersection. So this object over here will be a subset of each of these guys right here. Well, furthermore, each of these guys right here. And then next we'll see that the second condition will tell us that X is a subset of A union B. So let's maybe write that down. So two implies that X is a subset of A union B. So let's notice that putting this together, we have this nice string. So A intersect B is a subset of X, which is a subset of A union B. Now, if we make a Venn diagram, just to kind of get our heads thinking graphically. So if we've got set A, set B, we'll see that set X must live something like this right here. 
And that's because this bit in here is A intersect B. So A intersect B must be a subset of X, which in turn has to be a subset of A union B. And now we'll use a little bit of our experience to come up with a guess. So generally, if you've got your unknown bound between two known objects, and you're asked to find maybe all things satisfying some conditions, usually this X, this unknown, must either be this left-hand object, A intersect B in this case, or this right-hand object, A union B in this case. So now we'll do a little experimentation to see which one of these it should be, and then prove that carefully. So let's say we've got an element right here. So maybe we'll call this element little y. So what do we have going on here? We've got y is an element from x, but y is not an element from A intersect B. So any y that lives in that region would satisfy that rule. Also notice that by our picture here, we've chosen y so that it's in B. Although symmetrically, we could have put it over here so that it's in A. We'll notice that it's in B, but it's not in A intersect B, so that means that Y is in, let's see, B minus A. But notice that's gonna contradict something that's happening over here. We have Y is not in this A intersect B, but by these things that we have on the board, Y is clearly in the intersection of B intersected with X. And so like I said, putting this and this together gives us a contradiction. So what that tells me is that X cannot be bigger than the intersection of A and B. So in other words, this has to be pushed in to be exactly this intersection. And that's what we'll claim and prove on the next board. So in the last board, we came up with this guess that our unknown set X satisfying these two conditions must satisfy this rule. So X must be A intersect B. Now we're gonna do a little calculation just involving intersection and union rules, in particular De Morgan's laws, to prove this. And I wanna recall that we know trivially from what we talked about before that A intersect B is a subset of X, which is a subset of A union B. Okay, so let's maybe jump into the proof of our claim, which will finish this off. So let's maybe go ahead and start with the right-hand side of this set equation. So we have A intersect B, and I wanna notice that that's gonna be equal to A intersect B union A intersect B. You might say, well, why would we do that? Well, we've got two conditions down here. We've got an intersection condition and we have a union condition. And so we really need to introduce a union into this equation without changing the meaning of this left-hand set. So what's the way to do that? Well, that would be to union this set with itself. And then in our next step, we will exchange A intersect B with a intersect X and B intersect X. And that's because our goal in the end is to get this in terms of X. So that's the motivation for this next step, which I'll write down. So this is A intersected with X union B intersected with X. Now we can perform De Morgan's laws, which tell us how the intersection and the union um, distribute over each other. And in fact, what we can do is rewrite this as A union B and then intersected with X like that. And now we'll notice that we're immediately done. And that's because earlier we proved that X was a subset of A union B. And whenever you intersect something with its subset, you get the smaller set. In this case, you get X. But now let's look at this extreme left and right hand side and see that we have proven our claim. And that's a good place to stop.